Our second scripture reading comes from the Gospel according to John, chapter 14. And I'll be reading verses 1 through 4, 18 through 19, and 25 through 27. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. I want to spend some time this morning talking about death. There has been a lot that we have raised in prayer together, and this is a season that, for whatever reason, always around this time is a wave of pain and hardness and loss um, that I will never, as a pastor, understand what that rhythm is about, but it is a rhythm I have continually encountered year to year. And it's a really hard time. This is a time of gathering around tables and festivities, and absence is very poignant um, and very real. Um, and even if it has been a beautiful goodbye and a beautiful passing, there's still a weight that rests with us. And then if it wasn't a beautiful passing, if it was traumatic or if it was there were harmful words said or things done that we can't take back and undo at this moment, it becomes that much more haunting and difficult. And so I want to spend a little bit of time today putting that in God's hands. I want to spend some time looking at death on the continuum that we know in life of moving from a known into the unknown and how each of us has already done that, no matter how old or how young we are, and how we will once again do it again when we are birthed into a life that we do not yet know and cannot yet get a sense of. But there is a God. We begin each and every service to remember that there is a living God who is at work to bring forth life from death and every single stage of the journey. And every single time when we move from a known to an unknown, whether we want to or whether it is thrust upon us, there is a living God working to bring that into wholeness and into life. There will be times when this transition um, comes about because of the forces of wickedness and the powers of evil that are at work in our world and have nothing to do with God's plan for us or for our loved ones. But yet God is still the God who is living, who will take even that harm and that pain and that injustice and bring something whole and something life-giving out of it if we partner with God in moving from the known to the unknown. If we open our heart at the very time when the world has shut it down, if we dare to trust again, if we dare to risk again, this is the journey of faith. And it is not something that we can do on our own. It is something that we do because of God's love that gives us power inside of us and because of the support of a community that is there for us. Because of the stories of witness of other people who have moved from knowns to unknowns and what God has brought about when they couldn't see it before so that those of us who are still trapped in that place of not being able to see it or feel the hope or even get a sense of God's presence still have a witness in front of us in our lives saying that as much as that reality feels hopeless and lost, it is still present and here. 
And so we do this journey together. It's a journey that the early church did together. One of the very first things that they were up against was how to understand the people dying around them because they were fully convinced that they believed in what Christ had told them and what they had heard from him, that Christ would return before that generation passed, that the Roman Empire would be overthrown and God's reign would be established on earth. And in the space of that power of that belief, they were able to do amazing things. John McGuck had made the connection um, at Bible study last week of, I don't know if you've heard it from the passage of Acts, that first, that second chapter where the community is gathered together and have sold all their possessions, everything they're holding in common. And it's a pretty radical move, right? Like everything, 100%. And they were able to do that because of the urgency they felt because this was the time and this was the hour and nothing else mattered because Christ was going to return. So it was all on the battlefield. They gave absolutely everything. And there's a truth to take from that, the urgency and the clarity of purpose. It didn't last for forever, but it was there for that time period. And as Christians who have gathered, you know, today, a couple thousand plus years later, we don't have that same urgency that the early church had. And, and just in using the one, one um litmus test of, of how we share our resources. There it was 100% all in. And in 2013, the statistics were out that only 5% of, um, of uh, US Christians here in America um, tithe. And that's 10%. That's a long way from 100%. And it looked like about 80% of those who gave, gave 2%. That's a long way from 100%. So how do we learn the lessons that the immediacy of death, the truth of that belief can teach us in how we live? Folks who are going through the horrible thing of having new diagnoses given to them of terminal illnesses know the clarity of how it lines up values and what happens and what the small things are that fall away and what become the essential pieces of life. And so in our United Methodist Funeral Liturgy, when we pray as those who live prepared to die, part of that is the urgency and the clarity of purpose and truth that that brings to us and what really is meaningful, and what the values really are. That's what we looked about at all last summer in the spiritual fruit and how we give more time. I got to say, as a pastor sitting on deathbeds, haven't really heard anyone, and it's, I, I, I don't say anyone or everyone easily because there's always usually a caveat there, but in my ministry so far, there has not been one person who has told to me, I wish I spent more time at work. But I can't tell you the number of people who wish they had spent more time in values of family or in faith or in growth. And so how do we live as those who are prepared to die? How do we live as those who carry with them the essential values of who we are and what we are about and live in that sense of urgency? But how do we also die as those who go forth to live? It's both and. For that early church, their sense of hope had to change because it was clear that Christ was not going to return before the first generation had died. People were dying. That's part of why we have the canon of scripture because it was an oh crap moment. We better get some of this down before it's all gone and out of memory. And so how do we give room for hope to change? Any family facing a long-time illness knows what this journey is like. The journey that starts out with hope that there will be a cure, that there will be healing. And sometimes that hope is realized. But sometimes it isn't. And that hope turns into a hope to be able to die at home. Or to be able to die after a wedding or a birth. 
But no matter what, that hope is always present. We will always have hope. But what we hope for will shift and will change as we go through the knowns and the unknowns that are a part of life. And how do we do that together as a church? It's been 2,000 years. We know that Christ is not going to immediately return. But what is our hope? What do we long for with all of our being, for our communities, for our world? What do we want to see? And what are we waiting for? And how are we living in that waiting to give that hope life? As we work this journey together, we work it in a sense of urgency and call and purpose, and also in a sense of timelessness and patience, that blessed spiritual fruit nobody wants to talk about, myself included. But what does it look like to remember that a thousand years to God is as one day? And one day is as a, a thousand years. What does it look like to remember that God is outside time and space as we understand it here? And in that, what does it look like for ourselves to shift in our hope, to not feel that God is so long delayed and has so waited and has left us hanging, but is rather a gorgeous spiritual fruit of patience that God is waiting for all of us to find the light of his love, to find the salvation of her grace and to come forward and to claim that so that there is a patience so that we can all be saved and all be given new life and that there is a time that is worth waiting for that to happen and that that can happen from life into death. Because as Second Peter says, what we are called to, can you bring up Second Peter, Barry? Thanks. What we are called to um, is, and this is a great line from John, don't let your hearts be troubled, right? As we are in this journey, um, because there is a way that we are all working together. We are all working together, if you can go back to Second Peter, and that there is a heaven and earth that will pass away, that will melt down before the final goal of, of our entire faith journey is realized when thy will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And so we come together in patience, not thinking of God as delaying and slow, but grace-filled and wanting all to come together in repentance. And no, we don't know when we will die. And no, we don't know when the Lord will return. But what we do know is that heavens will pass away and the earth will pass away. For that unity, for that vision to come about. And so here together as God's family on earth, we work. And we do everything we can to build that faith patience and to pursue God's truth and to help one another move from known to unknown. But we do that through death as well into the community of saints. For I'm convinced that there are folks who are still working in the community of saints to bring about this same goal of heaven being unified with earth simply in a different plane, in a different way than outside of the time and space that we can feel and sense know. And that is good news because that means for whatever the goodbyes that were not had because of the way death stole in and earth here, or whatever goodbyes were not said because of the pain of a last word or a last fight before the passing happened, there is still time because the heavens haven't passed away yet and earth hasn't passed away and there is still reconciliation that is being wrought and being brought about by God in the community of saints just as God is working here on earth. And there is a connection that we can have as we work to develop disciplines of prayer that we work to open ourselves up to God working through the community of saints. 
that can happen between this earth and this heaven as we wait for the new heaven and the new earth where righteousness is at home. And so instead of that com common phrase of look busy, Jesus is coming, next slide, Barry, may we be found at peace. You can, from 2 Peter, if we can find while you are waiting for these things, for righteousness to be found, for heaven to reign on earth, may we strive to be found by Jesus at peace. Pursuing all righteousness, regarding the patience of God as our salvation. There will be death before Christ returns, but there is always hope. And may we live from that hope in peace and in righteousness.